All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. Today we are talking about what I've been calling multiculturalism as a distinct literary period that essentially occupies in American literature or maybe in certain ways Western literature more broadly the end of the 20th century. And uh, I defined some of the social and political background and the kind of background as far as the changes in every aspect of literature, from the teaching of literature in universities to the commercial publishing of literature, um, how that was affected by this multicultural paradigm that became, if not dominant, then certainly very prominent in the late 20th century. And I suggested that that multicultural perspective kind of structured the way we were looking back in the earlier part of the class into the first half of the 20th century, which perhaps didn't understand itself as multicultural, but we can now understand it through that lens. Um, so that's where we were last week. And then what I was going to do was introduce four characteristics that I see as really defining multicultural literature. Um, and I was going to introduce those characteristics by giving you four poems that I think exemplify them. And then that would uh, give us a framework through which to read our next novel, Antelope Woman by Louise Erdrich. So I want today to uh, finish talking about those four poems. We talked about one uh, last lecture. We have three more to go. And then I want to introduce Antelope Woman and Louise Erdrich and the genre in which I see Louise Erdrich writing, which is magical realism, which I uh, labeled this unit on the syllabus. And then next, in the next two lectures, I will actually deal with the text of Erdrich's novel, uh, the plot, the characters, the themes, etc. So that's what I want to do today. So we already saw, <clears throat> excuse me, we already saw our first characteristic of multicultural literature in Yusuf Komenyaka's poem To Doe Street, which was what I was calling the interrogation of history. The idea that um, with a multicultural perspective, you can't just take history for granted as the story of kind of any given society's ruling elites, or you can't take uh, history for granted as a story of a, an upward curve of progress, that all of these older ways of narrating history leave out the voices of those who were marginalized or oppressed by those processes. And so you have to uh, examine, interrogate history for those voices. You have to do history from below, as people uh, sometimes put it. And I used Kamanyaka's poem as an example because he both, in his own voice, narrates his sense of exclusion in a de facto, if not formally, segregated U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. Uh, so he sort of gives his own from below perspective as someone who was marginalized by a certain dominant culture. But then at the end of the poem, when he writes about the um, sex workers in Vietnam that he and his comrades in the army would contract with, and how they were also the sisters or other female relatives of the Vietnamese men they were fighting. Uh, I suggest that he sort of signals to us, this was my kind of optimistic reading of the poem, that he kind of signals to us that we also need to attend to these other voices, which can't appear in his poem. No one voice can tell the whole story. I think that's another multicultural kind of a commitment. But he, he suggests they're there. So that was my, my hopeful reading of the poem. There is another reading that maybe it is, as I said, I think in the last lecture, sort of naively sexist, then maybe that's true as well. Maybe you can write a paper about it. I don't know. But, uh, but that's, that's the first characteristic. The second characteristic I want to look at, and it relates very strongly to what I was just discussing about the end of Komenyaka's poem, is an examination of gender which, with a focus on women's experiences, often of male violence or patriarchal oppression. And we talked about how you know, the mid-century period and the, uh, the mid-century period was a kind of a very masculinist or very male-dominated period of literary history in the United States, at least, um, and how the last part of the 20th century, uh, you know, changed that because there were demographic shifts. More and more women were able to seek higher education, to enter professions, to become 
writers, uh, etc. So, um, so uh, the multicultural period is often very much one that's concerned with gender. Uh, I don't necessarily want to say it's feminist because we talked about the conflicts within feminism regarding things like race, class, and sexuality, and a lot of the um, writers of the what I'm calling the multicultural period would not necessarily have identified themselves with feminism as such because some of them might have seen that as a more of a white middle class formation though others very much did identify with feminism but instead of applying that term which I think you know can can describe something a little more narrow I want to give just use the broad idea of an examination of gender with a focus of, on women's experiences, often of male violence. And I think you'll see that borne out in a lot of ways in Erdrich's novel. But the poem I want to use to discuss uh, that with is I's poem, The Kid. So I, uh, you see her pictured there on the slide, lived from 1947 to 2010. And she was born Florence Anthony, but she changed her name to I, which means love in Japanese, because her father was Japanese and her mother had had an affair with him. So that was kind of a, a love affair that she was born from. And she identified as Japanese, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Black, Irish, Cheyenne, and Comanche. And so she, um, and when I say she identified, I mean she identified as all of that. So, you know, sometimes. Well, identity is very complicated. You can have a very mixed cultural or ethnic heritage and identify with one part of it. I think we'll see that in a later poet we're going to look at, Paula Gunn Allen. But for I, it was very important that she identified with all of that, that she sort of saw herself as this um, uh, compendium of heritages, this compendium of cultures in her own person. So um, just briefly about her biography, uh, she, she taught at Oklahoma State University and died in 2010, and she won many awards, including the National Book Award. Like most of the authors we're going to see from now on, uh, she basically had an academic career, and that became kind of the literary path with the professionalization of literature in the mid-century that we already talked about in this class. Um, and that, that was true of Komunyaka as well. Um, so uh, the thing about I, though, that I mentioned about her kind of wanting to identify as this plural identity is that it, 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 is, it is exemplified in her work in that as a poet, she was known for writing in a particular poetic genre called, and I just put the definition on the next slide, the dramatic monologue. And we've already discussed this uh, in terms of, I think, Gwendolyn Brooks's We Real Cool, but I said I would hold off on a fuller explanation until later. So the dramatic monologue is a particular genre of poetry uh, in which, um, I put the definition there, but the basic idea is that the speaker of the poem is clearly not the author. Because poetry in the modern period is often considered a very autobiographical genre. It's often, it has a speaker, uh, but the speaker is very often identified with the author. But when you write dramatic monologues, and there's a number of poets who are kind of famous for writing dramatic monologues, Ezra Pound, in fact, uh, among poets we've seen in this class, wrote a lot of them. A poet who writes dramatic monologues is more invested in using poetry not to express the self, which we've certainly seen a lot of in this class in, um, you know, Gertrude Stein or Muriel Rockheiser uh, or Mary Baraka, but the dramatic monologist wants to uh, almost use poetry like fiction to have a character narrate an experience. And so instead of the poet exploring her own subjectivity, like Gertrude Stein or Muriel Ruckheiser, the dramatic monologue poet uh, explores the subjectivity and the experience of a fictional character that represents someone very different from the poet. And like I said, we saw that with We Real Cool, where Gwendolyn Brooks writes about uh, people of a much younger age and of a different gender than herself. Uh, we saw it in Robert Hayden's Middle Passage. Much of that poem is a, almost a series of dramatic monologues that the poet writes to kind of explore the mentality of the people who were the, the, per, uh, the perpetrators of slavery. So I, too, uh, uh, writes in that form of the dramatic monologue. And I think that goes along very well with her sense of herself as someone who 
uh, as Walt Whitman put it, contains multitudes, that she has this plural, plurivocal, multivocal identity that can't be reduced to one thing. Now, the interesting thing, too, about I's use of the dramatic monologue is that she's known for dramatic monologues that are very kind of violent and transgressive. And that's a risk, you know, because it's not like poems that are dramatic monologues are labeled dramatic monologues when you find them in a book. And so she's writing in the voice of people who aren't only different from herself in, in I don't know, let's say a more mundane way, like, you know, she, you know, she's a woman and she writes about a man. No, it's, it's much more, it's much more uh, da you know, dangerous than that from the point of view of the poet because she often writes dramatic monologues whose speakers are violently transgressive, you know, and that's kind of a bold act because, you know, often a poet is identified with the speaker. And so she's, you know, taking a bit of a risk there. So this is one of her more famous dramatic monologues called The Kid. And I think it exemplifies the trait of an examination of gendered experience because it is a dramatic monologue from written by a female poet from the point of view of a violent man or a violent uh, young man. He seems to be quite young. So I'm just going to read the poem real quick and then I want to make a few remarks. My sister rubs the doll's face in mud, then climbs through the truck window. She ignores me as I walk around it, hitting the flat tires with an iron rod. The old man yells for me to help hitch the team, but I keep walking around the truck, hitting harder until my mother calls. I pick up a rock and throw it at the kitchen window, but it falls short. The old man's voice bounces off the air like a ball I can't lift my leg over. I stand beside him waiting, but he doesn't look up, and I squeeze the rod, raise it, his skull splits open. Mother runs toward us. I stand still, get her across the spine as she bends over him. I drop the rod and take the rifle from the house. Roses are red, violets are blue. One bullet for the black horse, two for the brown. They're down quick. I spit, my tongue's bloody. I've bitten it. I laugh, remember the one out back. I catch her climbing from the truck, shoot. The doll lands on the ground with her. I pick it up, rock it in my arms. Yeah, I'm Jack, Hogarth's son. I'm nimble. I'm quick. In the house, I put on the old man's best suit and his patent leather shoes. I pack my mother's satin nightgown and my sister's doll in the suitcase. Then I go outside and cross the fields to the highway. I'm 14. I'm a wind from nowhere. I can break your heart. So what's, I think, compelling about this poem is that it's a... I think when I've taught this poem in person, I've struggled to suggest to students that there's an air of parody or satire or humor to it. And you might find that a very perverse thing to say because it's a terrible story that's narrated in this poem. This young man kills his whole family and runs away. But it's full of these little details that are sort of quotes from nursery rhymes. Roses are red, violets are blue. Yeah, I'm Jack, I'm nimble, I'm quick these nursery rhyme fairy tale structures. Um, and I, what, I, what I mean by that, that the poem has an air of parody or satire that is signaled by these almost ch you know, childlike moments in the poem, is that I think it's eyes kind of deliberately over the top story of male initiation. How does a boy become a man? Well, a boy becomes a man by killing his father and then also killing and abusing the rest of his family down to the animals. So a kind of violence, a kind of rebellious violence is what makes a boy a man. And just as nursery rhymes kind of inculcate the stories of a culture to the growing child, so I think I is suggesting that, the, you know, this is the plot of masculinity, that you become initiated into masculinity by these acts of violence. And why does she use a kind of over-the-top aspect to it? Why is it so extreme? This is a very extreme circumstance, of course. No, most of the, probably 99.999% uh, of men don't have this experience. Why does she use this example? Well, I think it's because she's trying to say that this is the extreme case this is the limit case of what is normal for masculinity, which is that masculinity becomes masculinity through these acts of violence. 
And so she puts it in a way that's so over the top, we almost laugh at it, but satire always makes us think. It always makes us reflect. It always makes us question our assumptions. So if she told a more mundane story that didn't have these qualities of grim, dark humor to them, maybe we wouldn't, we, we would be more quiescent, we would be more complacent in our reading of it. But by telling the story in such an over-the-top way, she, may, she calls attention to what underlies this story. Okay, so I hope I explained that well enough. Though you'll note that it, you know it begins, my sister rubs the doll's face in mud. So it seems like violence is pretty universal in the world of this poem. Even the younger sister is kind of abusing her doll, um, and so and that you know there's there's a whole there's a kind of an idea in this poem that underlying the culture of children is are these acts of violence. Is this summoning to violence that breaks out in this poem uh, and that that is what underlies the sort of pattern of development of bildung to go back to an earlier term in our course in our society so and she couldn't do that without the dramatic monologue she gives it to us from the perspective of this character he tells his own story and from his own story we infer what it has to do with with everything else and with the social comments she's making so that's Eyes the Kid exemplifying the multicultural period's interest in gender and particularly a kind of critical approach to gender roles that is you know, aiming to explore their assumptions with uh, a focus often, I think, on, on male violence that I think you see in a lot of the literature, particularly the fiction of this period. All right, the next trait I want to look at, I want to use Garrett Hongo's poem, The Legend, to exemplify. So Garrett Hongo was born in 1951. He was born in Volcano, Hawaii to third generation Japanese American parents, then moved to Los Angeles where he was raised. He attended Pomona College uh, in California for English. He worked for a year in a Buddhist monastery in Japan. Then he got his master's degree at uh, UC Irvine in California, and he founded a theater group for um, Asian Americans in Seattle in 1975. And he started publishing poetry in 1982 and taught at a variety of schools, most recently the University of Oregon. So again, though he had a very interesting early life, especially that period in the Buddhist monastery and that period running a theater. Um, he too sort of eventually ended up in the, in the academic career. Um, so that's Garrett Hongo. And I think his poem, The Legend, is an example of the multicultural period's interest in a critique of culture considered white or European. Now, we've already seen this. We saw that implied in Langston Hughes, um, and we saw, the, we saw it sort of raised in Philip Roth, not so much uh, you know, uh, critiquing European culture, but critiquing maybe um, a Gentile form of culture from a Jewish American perspective. But I think in the multicultural period, it, it comes to the fore that some of the literature we've already read, which was more, uh, I think its authors would have considered themselves kind of universal in their thinking, like Robert Hayden or Richard E. Kim, who I think saw things like Western literature and Western religion as compatible with their own cultural perspectives. I think here, following more from Amiri Baraka, we have a critique. We have a critique of culture considered white or European. So let's look at Hongo's poem, The Legend. I want to read it, you know, just read it quickly from 1988. In Chicago, it is snowing softly, and a man has just done his wash for the week. He steps into the twilight of early evening, carrying a wrinkled shopping bag full of neatly folded clothes, and for a moment enjoys the feel of warm laundry and crinkled paper, flannel-like against his gloveless hands. There's a Rembrandt glow on his face, a triangle of orange in the hollow of his cheek, as a last flash of sunset blazes the storefronts and lit windows of the street. He is Asian, Thai, or Vietnamese, and very skinny, dressed as one of the poor, in rumpled suit pants and a plaid mackinaw, dingy and too large. He negotiates a sli the slick of ice on the sidewalk by his car, opens the fair lane's back door, leans to place the laundry in, and turns for an instant toward the flurry of footsteps and cries of pedestrians. As a boy, that's all he was, 
backs from the corner package store, shooting a pistol, firing it once at the dumbfounded man who falls forward, grabbing at his chest. A few sounds escape from his mouth, a babbling no one understands as people surround him, bewildered at his speech. The noises he makes are nothing to them. The boy has gone, lost in the light array of foot traffic dappling the snow with fresh prints. Tonight I read about Descartes' grand courage to doubt everything except his own miraculous existence, and I feel so distinct from the wounded man lying on the concrete, I am ashamed. Let the night sky cover him as he dies. Let the weaver girl cross the bridge of heaven and take up his cold hands. So with this poem we have, this poem is interesting because it's in the third person for most of its length. We don't hear the voice of the poet until the end. And it begins by narrating um, a story, which is the story of the murder, seemingly somewhat... Uh, random murder as a as an instance of kind of urban street crime of a young asian american uh who's identified as poor and he's asian but of ambiguous national or ethnic origin so that's the that's the narrative we're given and <clears throat> there's a sense of the alienation of this uh man who's been killed a few sounds escape from his mouth a babbling no one understands Presumably he's speaking in his in his native language and the people around him, you know, only speak English and don't understand him. So there's a sense of the alienation of the immigrant that's being reflected here um, within a broader sense of urban alienation that's also marked by street crime. But I want to really focus in on the last part of the poem. I think that's what exemplifies this idea of the critique of culture considered white or European. Because Hongo contrasts a European philosophy with a Chinese, or I think more broadly, Pacific Rim myth. So he says, I read about Descartes' grand courage to doubt everything except his own miraculous existence. So Descartes was a 17th century French philosopher, and he's known as one of the founders of modern Western philosophy, because what he did was he began by saying, how do I know anything's true? How do I know that anything I perceive is real since I'm sort of locked in here in my own mind? How do I know? He even goes as far as to say, what if I'm being tricked by an evil demon? What if I'm being tricked? How can I, locked inside my own consciousness, believe anything outside of it is real and not just a trick of that consciousness? What is reality? And so Descartes begins with this grand doubt, this doubt of everything. And how does he rescue himself from what might be the nihilism produced by this insight that since we are, I, I think it is an insight, genu a genuine insight, that since we are locked inside our own subjectivities, how can we know if what we're experiencing is real? How does he save himself from this? He famously saves himself by saying, well, the one thing I do know is that I'm thinking. I think, therefore I am. That's his famous, in Latin, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. In other words, I exist. How do I know I exist? Because I'm able to even think this thought at all. So if I exist, then other things have to exist. And from there, he builds all the way back to proving that God exists from there. It's, a, it's a actually a fairly remarkable argument. But he begins with this moment of grand doubt that's rescued by this assertion of the individual. And I think it's that individualism that Hongo is seeing in Western culture that creates the urban alienation, the alienation of the immigrant, the random murder, the inability of people to understand each other. Western society, American society is atomized. It's, it's not just that we're all individuals, it's that we're all these separate atoms and we have nothing to do with each other. And it creates this terrible alienation, I think, from his perspective. That he traces, he, so he traces back these very modern American circumstances, urban crime, the alienation of the immigrant, to Descartes' individualism, which is at the root of modern Western philosophy. And what does he contrast it with? He contrasts it with a Chinese folktale of the cowherd and the weaver girl that's what he's referring to in the last stanza 
So it ex like like any myth or folk tale, it exists in many iterations and forms. But the basic idea is there's a love story between a weaver girl and a cowherd, and their love was forbidden. It was uh, you know a Western corollary might be like Romeo and Juliet. So they were banished to opposite sides of the Silver River, which is analogous to the Milky Way galaxy. And once a year on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month, a flock of magpies would form a bridge to reunite the lovers. So instead of the individualism of Western philosophy, we have this assertion of an Eastern myth that while it has elements of separateness, these separated lovers, it, the basic point of the myth is togetherness, this bridge that brings people together. So he sort of downgrades the Western perspective as he sees it as too atomized, too individualist, and upgrades the Eastern perspective as more indicative of a more communal, more humane order. And it's in that sense that the legend Oh, and by the way, the title, uh, most of the titles of these poems so far have been self-explanatory, but uh, the legend is, requires a little more uh, interpretation. The legend is, I think, the legend of the weaver girl, number one. I also think it's, um, if a legend is kind of a key on a map that tells you where to go, the legend is a kind of legend, a social legend, a legend pointing the way to how we should map our social lives for Hongo. And then finally, since he spends so much time telling us the story of the dead man, uh, he takes this nameless man that he, he feels so isolated from and memorializes him, makes him into a legend, takes him from his urban anonymity and makes him into the hero, if the tragic hero of the legend that is Hongo's own poem. So I think it has those three meanings, the legend of the weaver girl, the poem as legend in the map sense, pointing us to a better future uh, or a better society, and the dead, the dead man as legendary in Hongo's eyes. And that brings me to my final characteristic of multicultural literature that I want to look at today, which is a concern often for family, how did I, I put a sort of pun on it or something on the slide, a concern for family and as culture. There is a lot of focus, I think, in a lot of the literature of this period, and you're really going to see this in Louise Erdrich, on family, uh, and how family is related to culture, how it is through families that culture is passed down. But on the other hand, you know, sometimes that goes along with the gender focus, as we saw in The Kid, and family becomes this place of violence, of domestic violence. And so it's often a very ambivalent or ambiguous look at family and how family does and does not perpetuate culture. It's not a simplistic celebration of culture because it sees that every, you know, as we talked about with, with the postmodern idea that every sort of... Um, every culture has its own kind of dominant and oppressive structure to it. And so uh, so family, I don't think, is celebrated as much as it's uh, focused on. There's a concern for family and how it does and does not perpetuate culture in ways that are good or bad, okay? And I think that in Polygon Allen's poem, Grandmother, um, now this is, is a much more celebratory poem, we see how this works out. So Polygon Allen lived from 1939 to 2008. She was born in New Mexico, and she was of mixed Laguna Sioux, Scottish, and Lebanese descent. Though unlike I, who, you know, we see all the different ways you can negotiate your own personal identity through the authors in this course. Unlike I, for whom it was very important that she identified as all the things in her background. For Polygon Allen, it was by contrast much more important to her that she identify as Lakota, because that was, or sorry, Laguna, because that was the culture in which she grew up. And so she identified um, that way. She received her Master's of Fine Arts in Poetry at University of Oregon and a PhD in Anthropology at the University of Mexico. And she had kind of a double career, one as a poet on the one hand, and I, I think also a novelist, but then on the other hand, she had a career as an academic, and she wrote very influential uh, 
academic text on the feminine in American Indian traditions, which I think is the subtitle of one of her books, that in her view, um, there were a lot of matriarchal and matrifocal and just generally feminine elements in many Native American cultures that she thought were not understood by the Western anthropologists who had analyzed them because they used a patriarchal lens. So we see that critique of, of culture considered European or white. So Polygon Allen's poem, Grandmother, it's pretty short. I'll read it quickly. Out of her own body, she pushed silver thread, light, air, and carried it carefully on the dark, flying where nothing moved. Out of her body, she extruded shining wire, life and wove the light on the void from beyond time beyond oak trees and bright clear water flow she was given the work of weaving the strands of her body her pain her vision into creation and the gift of having created to disappear after her the women and the men weave blankets into tales of life memories of light and ladders infinity eyes and rain after her i sit on my laddered rain-bearing rug and mend the tear with string. So what you have to know is the background to this poem is that it depends on an allusion, on a reference to something outside the poem, which is a reference to the myth in several different Southwestern Native American religions of the grandmother spider. So she is the creator of the world in Southwestern Native American religions and myths. And again, you know, with mythologies, it's, it's not, it's, you know, it, it's not just one story, but a multitude of stories. But the basic idea is that she was a sort of spider woman who was responsible for the stars in the sky. She took a web she had spun, laced it with dew, threw it into the sky, and the dew became the stars. And I just have an illustration that I pulled from the internet of, of this figure of Grandmother Spider. And what interests me in this poem Number one is you have the you have a myth, a creation story that couldn't be more different from the Christian creation story, because instead of a sort of bodiless and implicitly male creator God that you get in the Christian story who is outside of nature, here you have a female embodied part of nature, a spider and a woman who creates the universe. So it's a very different story. And I think, you know, there's an implicit contrast in this poem, just as Hongo is making an explicit contrast between what he sees as a more Western and a more Eastern worldview. She's giving a very different religious account of the creation of the cosmos from the Judeo-Christian one. And in her account, we have a female creator, a creator that's part of nature, and a creator that is, um, uh, well, that's it. Yeah, a female creator that's part of nature. Now, the other thing about this poem that's interesting in the, in the end of it is that it's in imitation of the female creator that all other aspects, creative, artistic aspects of the culture are made. After her, in other words, um, imitating her, following her, the women and the men weave blankets into tales of life, memories of light and ladders. So this female creator is the source of all subsequent creation. And she is the source of the culture and she's the grandmother. So we have a matriarchal system here. We have a, um, the female sort of progenitor of this culture is its ultimate kind of creator and the thing from which all the, the 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 being from which all subsequent creation comes and so that's the sense in which the poem is about family as a creation of culture as well as it's about uh re-centering the feminine as a creative artistic force and so also it's implied that alan's own poem is a uh, just another kind of iteration of the grandmother spider's weaving of the web of the universe all right so that's my last characteristic of multicultural literature with that i want to turn to a brief introduction to louise erdrich and before i talk about louise erdrich's life so i'm just going to do two things now i want to talk about the genre in which she as a novelist writes 
and then I want to talk about her life and then I'll end it and we'll pick up with the novel itself in the next lecture. So Louise Erdrich, along with a, a large number of other writers of this period, such as Toni Morrison um, and, uh, and, and uh, Leslie Marmon Silko and others, worked in a genre called magical realism. And as with any writers, it's not that they all identified with this term. Writers like don't, you know, quite rightly don't like when you try to pigeonhole them in a movement. So a lot of them were like, what is with the magical realism? That's just academic talk or something. Um, and they're probably right. And we should pay attention to the singularity of individual books and writers instead of always trying to group them. But nevertheless, I think naming some broad characteristics of the writing of a period does help us to understand individual texts. It helps us to see what we're reading in a, in a clearer light. And the term magical realism is so common at this point that I think it would be silly to avoid it. So what is magical realism? We already talked about realism in this class. It's a type of literature that takes as its subject matter everyday life, uh, everyday common experiences. And we saw really, in one way or another, all the books we've read so far have been realist. They haven't had any element of this, you know, of the fantastical. So magical realism starts with realism. It is about everyday life of ordinary people, but it adds to it a fantastical, supernatural, or surreal element. So um, you can distinguish it from realism because in strict realism, like say the martyred, you don't have anything supernatural really occur. Well, that's not even true, is it? Because you have that mysterious, uh, the fate of uh, of the Reverend Shin at the end. Is he a Jesus-like figure? So maybe that book is a magical realist book. Well, let's take Quicksand. So unlike Quicksand, where nothing supernatural occurs, I mean, it's pretty clear by the end of that book that Nella Larson doesn't believe in anything supernatural whatsoever. Magical realism takes realism and adds an element of magic. It's different from fantasy, you know, like the Lord of the Rings or something, because fantasy tends to create its own world. It tends to create its own world with its own internal logic. Magical realism is set in recognizably our world, our, our history, our social setting, but it adds an element of the supernatural. So magical realism, is, magical realism is by no means limited to the United States. In fact, it's a very much international literary mode, probably most associated with Latin American literature particularly in the writings of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, who was very influential on just worldwide literature, but also with Eastern European and Russian writing, like Philip Roth was very influenced by um, Eastern European and Central European Jewish writers uh, of the magical realist, you know, what we might consider a magical realist school, like um, uh, Franz Kafka, whom we mentioned in our lectures on the ghost writer, and with post-colonial writing more generally. So um, another big example is Salman Rushdie, who was of South Asian background and wrote from that perspective. So why, why, you know, what, what ties all these regions together? So all of those plus a lot of American kind of writing from marginalized or oppressed groups such as Jewish American, Native American, African American literature. Why, what is magical realism in its political significance? Well, I think what it is, is it's overlapping with the postmodernist and multicultural moments in literature at the end of the 20th century. And like them, it calls into question all dominant master grand narratives. It says that what you think is reality is not the only reality. Reality is much stranger than what you think of as reality. That's what magical realism posits. And I think the political edge there, when it's coming from writers who are from Latin American or African or Asian countries that had been colonized, whether it's coming from um, the Jewish diaspora, which had an experience of anti-Semitism and genocide, whether it's coming from minority groups within the United States, like African American and Native American, whether it's coming from Russia and Eastern Europe, which had experience with totalitarian communism. In all those cases, there was a dominant culture that tried to impose on people what reality was. And writers challenge that with magical realism by suggesting 
that um, reality is not what these dominant groups say it is. It also can be a way of giving expression to cultural beliefs repressed by Western or modern ideology. And you th I think you see that in Erdrich, that she takes a realistic, roughly, story, but underlying it are Native American myths that she signals in the text. And so the, 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 the fantastical element is her way of bringing into a realist text elements of Native American culture that don't fit within a realist paradigm that are that are mythical. Um, so in that sense, magical realism has this political edge of a dissidence toward a dominant group's view of what reality is, especially when that's imposed from above on a population that wants to resist it. And my illustration on the slide is just, uh, I think that just came up on Google Images when I looked up magical realism, but, uh, but it's a great example. It's two, it's a, you know, urban street, regular urban street, that's the realism, but walking down it are these angels. That's the magic, the supernatural element. And so that I think is the, uh, is the genre background of Louise Erdrich's Antelope Woman. So who is Louise Erdrich? She is um, an author who is local. So we're going to read a local author. And some of this novel is set around, you know, Minneapolis and environs. So she was born in 1954 in Minnesota and is a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians and a graduate of Dartmouth and Johns Hopkins. And her fiction, she started writing fiction in the 80s with her famous first novel, Love Medicine, which is very good. I recommend it. And her fiction is characterized by its magical realism and participation in what was called, not everybody likes this term, but the Native American Renaissance. So starting in the late 60s, when there, again, were all these social movements on behalf of marginalized or oppressed groups, there was an efflorescence of multicultural literature, and part of that was Native American literature. Now. Native American literature written in English goes all the way back to the mid 19th century. Um, the first Native American novel is published in the 1850s. So I don't want you, that's, that's the reason some people don't like this term. So I don't want you to think that Native American literature written in English starts in the 1960s, far from it. But it's when there was this, you know, generation of writers or two generations of writers of which Erdrich was a member that, um, that particularly, uh, that particularly marked the period. So that's the sense in which it's a renaissance. Um, and Erdrich, I should mention, by the way, is is a herself of kind of mixed cultural heritage. So I think her father, I didn't put it on the slide, I think it's her father was German Catholic and her mother was Ojibwe. So she has, and she often writes about, in her work, about a kind of culture clash between, particularly between Christianity, which she's very much in certain ways drawn to, particularly Catholicism, and on the other hand, Native American um, culture and mythology and religion, to which she's also very much drawn to. So this theme plays itself out in her work. She currently lives in Minneapolis, and she manages a bookstore in Minneapolis called Birchbark Books, in addition to writing. She's very prolific and has done a number of novels. Um, Antelope Woman. That's an interesting book because it's um, it was first published in the 1990s under the title The Antelope Wife, but Erdrich revised it in the 2000s uh, and gave it a new title, Antelope Woman. So in one ways it's in one way it's a 1990s text, but in another way it's a 2000s 2010s text. So we 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 can't kind of pin it down date wise there, and I won't. Um, make a big deal out of what changes she made or anything like that but uh, I just thought you should know um, so that is our introduction I think now we're ready to get into the text of Antelope Woman it's got a very complicated plot Erdrich loves to write about very tangled and complicated family histories and it could be a little bit um, confusing on a first read so I'm probably I probably am going to spend a certain amount of time as I did with the martyred going over the plot because I think we read Quicksand and we read The Ghost Writer, which I think were fairly straightforward in their plot, and I didn't spend a lot of time um, going over the plot. But then with The Martyred, with that spy story, and now with The Antelope Wife, and it's, or Antelope Woman, sorry, and it's very tangled genealogies, I think I do need to spend some time just going over the plot with you. 
but then we'll also look at the text we'll talk about the characters the themes the style the symbolism etc so that's what we'll do in the next lecture uh, in the meantime thanks very much for your attention and have a great day